If you want to sit a little closer, I'd appreciate it because I won't have to talk quite as loudly. What I would like to do this afternoon is talk with you about machine readable works and in particular computer programs. Now, what I would like to encourage you to do is to stop me and ask me questions at any point during this whole, what I'll characterize as a discussion. I don't want to stand up here and talk for an hour and find out that you really had a lot of questions that you should have asked earlier that would have helped me in my presentation. But rather, I'd encourage you to stop and ask me questions. Let me tell you what I, what I want to do and would like to talk through for you is I'd like to talk with you about what is a computer, what's a computer program, where did they come from, why do they look like what they look like, what is this business you hear about, object code and source code, and what does it all mean, and what are the differences? And then to talk to you a little bit about the history of the Computer Software Copyright Act of 1980. I think that will pretty much cover things. If at any point, let me repeat, if I don't cover something that you want me to talk about, or you have a question about words that I'm using, or what I may occasionally use some computer jargon. If you do, please stop me and ask me about it. What Ellen is handing out right now is an example that we'll use shortly. Uh, it's a few pages out of the last computer program I ever wrote back in the days when I did that sort of thing. It contains uh, a sample of some input data and a sample of some output. And we'll use it, use it as an example to talk about what a program is, what a database is, what input is, what output is, and how they all tie together. Computer programs or software are perhaps, right now I think as you're seeing in the division, one of the most important economically products of our modern computer and information age. In very general kind of terms, a computer program is a set of instructions laid out in excruciating detail that describe in a process in such definitive terms that even a literal minded thing like a computer if I can use that term in conjunction with a piece of hardware, can follow those instructions and do something. Now, the modern computer age started in the time period really right after World War II. And it got a lot of its emphasis from wartime research on plotting ballistics trajectories for uh, artillery pieces to enable the artilleryman to be able to shoot a gun from here to there and to be pretty sure of hitting something when you couldn't see what you were shooting at and you weren't, when you, you knew pretty much what you were shooting but you didn't know necessarily exactly where you were supposed to be going with it. You were able to use machines to aid in laborious calculations that if they were done by a human being would take weeks or months to carry out by using the machines that people managed to develop, you were able to carry out these very, very tedious mathematical computations in a matter of hours or maybe days back then that would have taken weeks otherwise to carry out. The first applications of computers followed in this track. Computers were originally grew out of work on making increasingly complex calculating machines. They were originally thought to be numerical information processors. They were going to be super colossal adding machines that could handle the financial and other numerical information that was needed in government and industry throughout the country. Well, shortly after World War II, a group of engineers formed a company to build something that 
got to be called the UNIVAC, the Universal, what is it, Numeric Integrator and Calculator, I think, is uh, where that term comes from. And that was the first modern computer as we know it. Before then, people had built computers using old technology, using relays, using uh, other electronic components. But the UNIVAC was the first computer that was really an electronic device. It wasn't an electromechanical device like an adding machine. Adding machines work because you have wheels and gears inside that interact in advance depending on what numbers you plug into them. The UNIVAC was the first device that did away with the mechanical components and relied entirely on electronic circuitry, vacuum tubes in those days, to carry out complex mathematical calculations. In the early days of computing, a machine like a UNIVAC-1 would have filled this room. They were large machines. They had rather limited capabilities and they did run using vacuum tubes. A big machine might have as many as 5,000 vacuum tubes in it. And the mean time between failures for these machines might be measured in minutes or hours. Anytime one vacuum tube blew out, you had to shut down the whole machine and start the process again. So if a vacuum tube went, when you have 5,000, 10,000 vacuum tubes, statistics catch up with you, and one of them is bound to burn out. And operating time in these early machines was measured in mean time between failures of hours. People were looking for better ways to carry out the electronics and to design the circuitry. And we progressed from the early vacuum tube computers to computers that were based on the use of transistors when those were developed and commercialized in the 1960s. Transistors, unlike vacuum tubes, don't burn out so fast. They last a lot longer. And computers begin to began to change at the same time because of this. When a computer that filled a room like this and cost several million 1950 dollars could be counted on to run for only a matter of hours at any given time, there wasn't much incentive to try to use them in many business and commercial or government applications. They were used in scientific areas where there was a very high payoff for their use. They were very expensive. They had to be custom built. There were only a few of them. And it took highly skilled mathematicians or engineers to be able to make them work, to do the programming. And in those very, very early days, the programming was done by actually changing the wiring inside the computer. I'm sure all of you have seen old movies from the 1940s that show people at switchboards for telephone calls, pulling up patch cords with a plug on the end and plugging them into a hole in a board with hundreds and hundreds of holes in it. Early computer patch boards worked something like that. You had a board with a bunch of holes in it, and you had wires with plugs on either end that were used to plug between different holes in that board. Those were then hooked into the computer, and that was the programming for the very, very early computers. It wasn't very efficient. It took a long time to do, and it could only be done by generally electrical engineers who, even back in the 1950s, for, by the standards of the day, were high-paid people. I remember reading a report once on the development of an early computer called uh, Ordvac, which was built at Aberdeen Proving Ground up at Aberdeen, Maryland. And I remember being amazed by the report in that it said, yes, and the expenses for building this machine and maintaining it have been so high because we have a large number of very high paid government employees on the staff, some in grades GS 13, 14, earning salaries as high as six and $7,000 a year. That just puts things in perspective a little bit. Just as the computers have changed, we've changed a little bit too in uh, lots of ways. But these early machines were expensive, difficult to use, difficult to maintain, difficult to program. And software 
programs for them were an incidental. They were almost like part of the hardware. Well, when we had transistors, as I mentioned before, computers began to move out of the laboratory because transistors don't fail as fast as vacuum tubes do. And you began to be able to build computers that would operate for hours or days or weeks, maybe even months, without major electronic failures. The electronics end of the computing business became very reliable. The software end, however, was slower to change. Computer software began to emerge from its earlier model of being something that was done by engineers using plug boards to something where you could sit down at a typewriter-like device and type in long strings of numbers that would be intelligible to the computer that the computer could use to internally do the equivalent of making all those wiring connections between different points. The engineers learned how to build into the computer certain instructions that were triggered by a certain sequence of coded numbers that were equivalent to an instruction that before meant that a wire went from this place to this place. Now, the engineers learned how to build the machines that would take numerical codes and substitute them for the, the numbers. And people began to be able to write computer programs in what was called machine language. You had to input the actual strings of ones and zeros that represented the binary equivalents of the coded numbers. And binary numbers aren't anything magic. I guess you could think about it as if you were uh, an octopus and only had tentacles for hands. You'd only have two fingers. And that's all you have to count with. Something is either a zero or it's a one. You have something or you don't have it. That's all binary numbers are. It's a number system in which you have only two numbers, one and zero. And in those early days of computing, to write a computer program, you had to very laboriously sit down and code out the string of ones and zeros that corresponded to the machine language instructions inside the computer for input into the computer to make it work. That was a great advance over the plug boards, but it left a lot to be desired. I know if any of you are as bad a typist as I am, numbers are the worst things in the world to try to type, let alone try to proofread. Just think about trying to proofread a page, a pr computer printout filled with ones and zeros to make sure every one and every zero is in the exact correct sequence. My God, it was a terrible job. And computer programmers tended to be kind of strange people. <laughs> people who could put up with it. Very often mathematicians. Mathematicians seem to like that work. And it, for some, also some reason, the early days of the profession seemed to attract a lot of people from the chemical area. I, my, my background is in chemistry, and maybe that's why I got interested in computers once upon a time. I don't know. But as the ability to, con to control the computer through more complex instruction codes came to be more generalized, computers came to be more widely used also. And they began to move out, as I said, from the scientific laboratory to be used in business applications. I remember another anecdote. Shortly after the first UNIVAC computer was delivered by the Sperry Rand UNIVAC company back in the early 1950s, the chairman of the board made an observation that was widely reported in the press at the time. He said yes, that he saw that perhaps someday the country would have the need for as many as, oh, five or ten of these magnificent machines where they could be used to handle all of the computing that would need to be done throughout the United States. Well, there are at least five computers in this building today, and there are hundreds of thousands of computers today throughout the country, let alone throughout the world. So people can be off in their predictions. 
The, as computers came to be more widespread, they began to go out into the hands of people who were not necessarily trained mathematicians or trained electronics engineers. Industry wanted to use computers. People in educational institutions wanted to use computers to aid in projects like information retrieval. People wanted to use computers to do calculations in a wide variety of areas. Businesses wanted to run payrolls using computers. Governmental organizations wanted to maintain their files using computers. And you needed an easier way to communicate with the machine than this machine code. You needed to be able to write programs in some more comprehensible means than a string of ones and zeros. So people began to look at ways of doing the coding more simply. And the first thing that they came up with, a sample of which I will show you later, is a kind of computer language called assembly language, which doesn't really take you too far away from the machine code, but it substituted groups of code letters for the numbers. So that perhaps instead of writing 10111000111100, you could write uh, BNA for branch, meaning um, take a different path in your program. If the contents of register location A is negative, you had symbolic notation. You had letters that corresponded to some code that might make you think of what that instruction was. And those letter groupings would be followed by some other numbers that would tell the computer what information it was supposed to work on and where it would be stored inside the computer. But that was just substituting one kind of very laborious coding for another. And people began to want even simpler ways to communicate with the computer. So in the early 1960s or mid-1960s, there were real efforts to develop languages that were more like kinds of language with which people normally deal. The first really widespread programming language that began to grow up was something called FORTRAN. It stands for Formula Translation. If any of you have examined works that where what you have looks like a whole string of mathematical statements a equals A plus B. Uh, if Y go to 468, instructions like that. That may well be Fortran, where one of the other mathematical computer programming languages, one of the more mathematically oriented ones, perhaps something like Algol or Basic, or likely Fortran. It's one of the most commonly used computer programming languages. Well. People in other disciplines didn't like to use mathematical symbology to represent everything, and they wanted different kinds of languages, and different kinds grew up. The other major, very commonly used computer programming language is something called COBOL. It stands for Common Business Oriented Language. It looks a lot more like English. Now, what these programming languages did was take the coding of those sets of ones and zeros a couple of steps further. Instead of having to write out 20 of these groups of three digit or three letter character groupings in assembler language, you might only have to write one instruction in a higher level language. And depending on whether the language you, want, you were using was mathematically oriented or business oriented, were oriented to, to for some other specialized application, you might be able to write one instruction like add if you're using mathematics or just use a plus sign. And the computer would translate that into the internal set of ones and zeros that it needed to be able to do what you told it to do. If you were using a higher level language like COBOL, 
You might have something like move, which is a common thing that one wants to do with information in a computer, to move it from one place to another that would be translated into a large number of steps. Now, what I have described to you shows that a computer program is really sort of like a, a spectrum. You have a group of ones and zeros that a computer can understand on one end, and on the other end you have languages like COBOL, FORTRAN, or what have you that people can understand. Computers can be built to directly understand things like FORTRAN and COBOL, but they're very expensive if you build them that way. And people can understand the ones and zeros, but it takes people an awfully long time to figure it out, and that's very expensive. So you try to tailor the two ends of the, the spectrum to the end where it's intended to be used principally. The ones and zeros for the computer and the things that look sort of like English for us on the other end. The words that you hear bandied about today about computer code, source code, that's the COBOL language and the FORTRAN language and the stuff that's fairly easy for human beings to understand. Object code is that string of ones and zeros on the other end of the spectrum that the computer can understand. That's really what the fundamental distinction is. Object code gets called different names, but fundamentally you've got code that a computer can understand and code that a human being can understand. Let me pass around another example. Dave Levy just asked a good question. What does the inside of one of these things look like? What's the inside of a computer look like? Are there wires in there or what are there? Well, the answer is yes. There are wires in there and there are a whole bunch of these little things called chips in there. There are things called circuit boards and all sorts of magical things that go on inside those boxes. I was never an electrical engineer and I'm not a computer hardware person, and for all I ever knew, a computer is more or less, from the electronics point of view, a magic black box that does things. I sort of know how it does it, but I'm not really prepared to explain the electronics or to try to explain the electronics. Now, let's take a look at the thing that I just that I just handed you out. Up in the upper right hand corner it's labeled 1, 2, and 3. Now if you take a look at the one numbered number 1, you will see, and by the way, this is a random page out of a computer program uh, that I think has to do with uh, the Scorpio system. It's a computer program that's used here in the Library of Congress on the IBM computers that we have in the basement. The first sheet number one that you have is a random page out of a computer program that's coded in assembler language. Now if you look down the middle, sort of around the middle of the page, you'll see the first thing you see is uh, some comments. some comments that tell you what, I think, I think I'm getting some signals from my cameraman, I'm supposed to hold up the listing here, is that good Bill? I'm sure that's going to show up on the screen, real, real well, but anyhow, here is the listing and it does say number one up in the corner, maybe you can see that, so if anybody wants to look at this tape later and use these examples, maybe you can key to it. 
Now, if we can look at the listing, in the middle you will see a comment that tells you what the uh, program is supposed to do. That's there purely for the benefit of us as people. That means absolutely nothing to the computer. It's a statement about what the program is supposed to do. When you get down, if you look at these line numbers, to the first one where you see a number 129, that's where you're getting down to business. You're beginning to set out a computer program. Now, if you look at the next step, you will see a line that says L x2 comma 0 per n x1 close per n. And off to the right, another comment that says get per n. I assume that that means go to a memory location in the computer and get its contents because it is a parameter that you need in this program that's coming up. I don't know what this program does and I'm not really an IBM assembly language skilled in that assembly language so I don't know exactly what these programs mean or these comments mean but that means something like load this storage location with some value. And if you will look over to the left of that line, you're going to see some other numbers. And if you look up at the head, you'll see some columns up at the upper, upper right-hand corner. One says LOC, it stands for location. One says object code, which is what it really is. It's the object code. And the other one says address 1 and address 2. Those are the two memory addresses that the instructions may work on. Now, the LOC means what location in the computer's memory is the instruction that you see written out going to be stored in. The first one, this 5821-0000, corresponds to that first thing that I explained to you, the L with followed by the X2, the 0, and the X1 in parens. That's the object code that corresponds to that assembler language code statement. And if you look down the listing just to scan it, you will see that by and large every assembler language statement corresponds to one object code statement. You can see it's just a different way of coding in a way that's more readable to a human being, this funny set of numbers and letters that you see over here under the columns headed object code. We have a question? Yeah, is that for all computer programs in this language, that particular instruction will always have that particular object code, or is that only within this one program? To get to object code from assembler code or source code, you have to have the computer program do the translation. Another computer program does the translation, and that's called an assembler or a compiler. This program that you see using this compiler, the same compiler, will always result in the same set of object code. It's just like if you were encoding something into an encryption scheme to use to make a secret message. If you used a code table and you started with one English language sentence, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy black dog or whatever, and you wanted to encode that, if you went to the code table to look up the code for the and wrote it down, it would always be the same. This is like a code table. The compiler or assembler does sort of the equivalent of, of this code table conversion. Assembler language programs are peculiar to particular computers. This is IBM assembler language code. It may be used, probably is used, on a fairly wide variety of IBM machines. But it would be unintelligible in a UNIVAC computer or a Burroughs computer or a Honeywell computer unless some very special and difficult to write software programs were written to enable that other computer to use it. Dave? So then the object code is not always binary, 0 or 1. It, it can be uh, one of the best numbers. 
Well, computers, fundamentally inside them, all computers use, ultimately use binary numbers. For purposes of saving space and making it easier to uh, understand the things, you can, the computer can print out binary numbers for you in different numerical systems. These numbers are written in something called hexadecimal code. You can think about that as if instead of only having two fingers, one on each hand, you had eight fingers on each hand, so you counted to base 16. So that your numbers go from one through, uh, what's the 16? If you go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, that gets 16 letters. It uses a combination of numbers and letters to enable you to count in base 16. When you see things listed under something like object code and you see this funny mix of numbers and the first uh, seven or six, the first six letters of the alphabet, you'll know those are numbers written in hexadecimal code. Another commonly used number system that's used to print out things like this is called octal, which is base eight. Now, if you're just counting on, your, four, on your, your fingers and ignoring the fact that you have thumbs, that's base eight. And uh, the computer ultimately represents these things internally as binary ones and zeros. But for purposes of making them intelligible by human beings, they're printed out in either octal or hexadecimal numbers, generally. Those are the two commonly used ones. Pam? What's the difference between decimal places and hexadecimal? Well, the way a computer works internally <coughs> is that you are able to store electrical charges in an electrical device. And you can have one of two things existing. You can either have a spot where there is an electrical charge or a spot of magnetism or a spot where there's nothing. So you only have the ability to represent fundamentally two states, on and off, zero and one. It's a binary system. There either is something there or there isn't something there. Now, the reason you don't use base 10 is that base 10 numbers don't break down too easily into binary representation. It's a fairly complicated process. But numbers to base, please don't ask me to try to explain it, but no, take my word for it. Numbers to base 8 and base 16, because they are multiples of 2, they're powers of 2. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. There is no power of 2 that comes out to 10. That's why you don't use decimal numbers. because. You can't pick out a finite number of ones and zero places inside the computer and group them together and say, translate that directly to a number. Well, that first four uh, two, uh, numbers, 58 and 21, the object code, are we read that as a, as 5, 8, 21, or, or? No, it's 5821 base 16. The one, well, to count that number, you would have to say, look to the rightmost number. It's a one. That represents a one, if you want to translate this to base 10. Look at the next column. That counts the number of 16s that you have. The two. The next column to the left. So you've got one, one, two 16s. That's 32. Now. The next column, where the 8 is, counts 16s of 16s, which are 256s. Is that right? Yes. So you've got 8 256s, and then 5, 1, whatever 16 times 256 is. I don't know off the top. 2056? And if you add all those numbers up, you'll come out with the decimal equivalent of that number it'd be a bigger number. And it's just harder for the computer to translate directly. If we don't have a blackboard, 
The reason that octal numbers and hexadecimal numbers are used in the computer is that they are natural powers of two. Two times two times two times two times two, so on. Gives you the various powers of the number. And if you take in a computer eight contiguous binary storage spaces, that number is directly equivalent to one octal number. It's simply a convenient way to do it. And you can't take 10 of them and say it's equivalent to a decimal number. It has to, they have to be grouped in, in groupings that, are, that go along with the powers of, t of two. You'd have to take two at a time, four at a time, eight at a time, 16 at a time, 32 at a time to make these translations simply. I hope that's understandable. I have a feeling that I've confused everyone totally. Are there any other questions at this stage? Well, take a look at this sheet that's labeled number one. And as I say, you can see what the examples of some uh, assembler language code statements are and what kind of object code statements go along with them. Now, this assembler language coding was the first advance that was made in computer programming that let people go beyond writing out numbers to communicate directly with the machine. Yeah. Those are comments that are designed to communicate with a computer programmer. Right. They're, they're just notations. No, it's a feature where each line in the assembler language code allows you to put a little extra information on it to help you remember what that instruction is supposed to do. The computer ignores that when it makes the translation from source code to object code. Now, if you'll look at page two, here we've got a very small program in another computer programming language. This one's written in one called COBOL. You can see it has, oh, just a few lines. It's not a very complicated program. And it looks a little more like English, albeit a very stylized kind of English. And it tells you to do some things. You could read it and have some idea what's going on. It says move four to work binary. That says move the number four to a memory location inside the computer that you've decided to call WK binary. And then it tells you to do some more things. Move something else from one place to another. Call a subroutine. Do some more moving. Make some tests, etc. And all you see here are the programming language statements just as a computer programmer would have written them. Now over to the left of those statements you see some line numbers again. Let's look at line number 00234 and then look at page 3 of your program. Now, what you've got on page 3 is the assembler language listing and the object code listing that corresponds to part of this program that's written in a higher level language. If you look slightly above the middle of the page, you'll see line number 234. Just to the right of the number 234, you'll see move. And then to the right of that, looking further over, 
you'll see some more of these funny object code type numbers. This is the object code that's associated with those various computer programming language statements. Now you see something like a move statement translates directly pretty much into one line of assembler code and object code. But look down here at this thing called call at line 239. If you look at page two, you'll see that call written out. And if you look back again at page three, you'll see what that one statement generated the next 20 or so lines of assembler language code and object code. that enables a computer programmer to write a single statement that makes the computer do a heck of a lot of work. And just like the question that came up before about does the same assembler language statement always result in the same object code, the answer is the same here. The same higher level language statement will always result in the same assembler language code and the same object code if you're using the same compiler program, the program that translates from the higher level language, COBOL in this case, to the lower level assembler and object code. It'll always come out the same. Now, let me back up a little bit. Are there any questions again now? think you got some idea of what these different languages are, sort of, a basic idea? Let's go back and look about why some of them came up. And this goes to another question that we edged around earlier. I mentioned that something like assembler language code is peculiar to one machine, or probably to a family of machines built by a computer manufacturer. One of the very popular series of IBM computers in the 1960s was the 360 series. All of the computers in the 360 series used the same set of assembler language instructions so that you could take a program that was written for the smallest of those computers and run it on any larger computer. It didn't necessarily work the other way because the bigger instructions, the bigger computers had extra features and instructions that the small ones didn't. And if you wrote a computer program in assembler language code using the features that were peculiar to the big machines, you couldn't take that program and run it on a little one. But they had what was called upward compatibility. You could always take a program from a smaller machine and run it on a big machine. Well, that was very nice for people who wanted to use IBM computers. And the 360 was the first really, really very widespread commercial computer. But what about people who wanted to buy Honeywell computers or Univac computers or Burroughs computers? They couldn't use the IBM assembler language code programs. And indeed, if you bought a, a IBM computer, did all your programming in assembler language, and a Burroughs salesman came in two years down the road and said, look, I can sell you a computer that will do everything that this one can do, and it's going to cost you half the amount of money, that sounds like a wonderful deal until you stop and realize that if you've written all your programs in assembler language code for the 360, you can't use that on the Burroughs computer. You can't take advantage of the cost savings. This kind of programming locked people into particular computer lines. Well, a lot of people for economic reasons realized that wasn't a very sensible decision. The better thing to do would be to have computer programming languages that could be used on a wide range of computers. And they'd be understandable by mostly any computer you could buy. So that if you were this year using an IBM computer and next year Honeywell would give you a better deal, you could move to the Honeywell machine and still be able to use your, your programs. 
That's the economic reason why things like Fortran and COBOL were invented. I could take this same COBOL program that's on page two of your example and run that on any commercial computer that has a COBOL compiler. The data general mini computer that's used for coins has a COBOL compiler available to it. It could use this program. A UNIVAC computer has COBOL compilers. It can use this program. All major computer manufacturers sell compilers that will translate statements written in this standard language of COBOL into the programming languages for those particular computers. It'll go through the same process that I showed you using this example from the machine downstairs. It translates it to assembly language and translates that to object code. Now, this development is really what gave rise to the development that we're seeing now. We're seeing the tail, not the tail end of it, we're seeing just the beginning of it here in this office. Before the early 1960s, when these languages like COBOL and FORTRAN were developed, programs were peculiar to particular machines, and there wasn't much market for them. They were developed by users, used in that environment, and not much else was done with them. But in the early 60s, when there began to be a large number of computers and a large number of installations, you began to see independent companies developing programs to sell to a wide range of vendors. And when that happened, people began to be concerned about marketing these things and selling them, just like you'd sold computers. When the programs were tied up to the machines, that provided the market protection that the manufacturers needed. You couldn't use the, the, the programs without the computer. Now you were begin beginning to get into cases where programs had a life separate and apart from the computers on which they were run. And people began to be concerned about the legal protection of computer software. And that started to happen in the early 1960s. At first, people thought that perhaps they should be protected by patents. People began to look at other legal doctrines like trade secrecy. And finally, I think it was in 1964, somebody approached the Copyright Office about registering a computer program. His name was John Bonshoff, and at that time he was a law student at George Washington University here in the city. And he did manage to secure, I guess, after long nagging and perseverance, a decision from the office that we would accept computer programs for registration. Bill, are we about out of tape on this side? Yeah, about 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, now, the reason for, as I said, this interest was that there was beginning to be an independent software industry that was interested in going into business and competing with the big computer hardware manufacturers. Now, throughout the 1960s, this trend continued to grow and the independent software industry continued to grow too. But the market in which computers were sold was a funny one. Computers still were big, expensive machines. They weren't the size of thing that filled this room like the first UNIVAC did, but they were still pretty substantial pieces of industrial equipment that cost hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of dollars. They were still expensive gadgets. And they tended to be sold by sales representatives from the big companies who went to individual companies and negotiated for the sale of the machine, just like you buy a piece of other machinery for your company. And the computer programs tended to be sold along with the machines. Or if you wanted to buy computer programs from one of these independent software houses, you bought them from the same kind of a salesman arrangement. These programs tended to be sold or leased, typically, 
in a few copies for thousands of dollars, and the transactions were handled by salesmen in face-to-face -face dealings. And typically, the way things were done was by contracts of lease or license based on trade secrecy kind of arrangements. Well, the late 1960s began to see some changes in this, and early into the 70s. We had the development of new kinds of computers that were called mini computers. As I mentioned before, we have one here that's made by Data General that runs our coin system. These are, in electronic terms, very much like the big computers, only they're smaller and they're cheaper. They don't have quite as much capacity, but they can do a lot. Those computers began to be sold in greater and greater numbers. But they were still typically sold by the same kind of arrangement. You had a salesman calling on a customer, and you sold a computer. You bought some software from that salesman. Another salesman called on you, and you bought some more software or leased some more software from them. Everything being done on a contract basis. Well, a few years ago, some very, very smart people came up with some new gadgetry. Some things called microcircuit chips that threatened to really revolutionize computing and computer usage. Inside this piece of plastic, is a little thing called a microcircuit chip. It's about an inch and a quarter long, and this particular one is maybe a half an inch wide. It looks sort of like a centipede with a bunch of legs on the back that represent electric connections and enable it to be plugged into another piece of machinery. This little gadget has probably the computational power of the Univac 1 that I described to you before as the first commercial computer that would have filled this room. That thing cost millions of dollars. It needed expensive air conditioning systems to operate. It could run for a few hours between failures. This thing sells for 10 or 20 bucks. It can do the same computing job. It needs no air conditioning. It needs nothing. It's cheap, and they can be stamped out using a photo, a process somewhat similar to photo engraving, and millions of copies for just a few dollars a piece. Well, this gadget is changing the nature of the computer industry in the United States. Computers aren't just anymore commercial pieces of machinery. They're not just commercial machine tools. They're becoming consumer devices. You can go to the local computer shack. You can go to the radio shack. You can go to any one of a dozen different locations, and you can buy a computer that has the power of early commercial computers that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in 1950 dollars. That's millions of dollars in modern money. For a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand mm dollars, -hmm. any one of us in this room can go out and buy a very sophisticated computer. In fact, for about $150, you can go buy something called an Atari game playing system. All that is is a computer. It has one of these little chips in it. All the box is for is to hold the switches to enable you to communicate with this thing. That's all the big box is for. The guts of the Atari system is in a little chip like this. And it's a computer, a computer with some programming. And when you use an Atari system, you plug into it these cassettes that enable you to change the games that it plays. Those cassettes are computer programs. Computer programs aren't any longer monster things like you got when you have listings of several thousand pages comprising something like this. Computer programs now can be sold on chips, or diskettes, or what have you. And there's something like this. This is a complete computer program for playing one of these games like the kind you do on your Atari. 
It's a different marketplace than the old market. You don't have uh, salesmen calling on you in a three-piece suit and a white shirt uh, trying to sell you a computer and, a, and its associated programming. You go to the Radio Shack and you buy one of these gadgets like you buy an eight-track tape cassette or a Philips type tape cassette for your home stereo system. It's a different market. You don't transfer things by leasing, you sell them. You want to sell somebody a copy of this program and you want them to go away and never bother you again because your business is to sell computer programs. Your business is not selling computer hardware anymore. There's a whole new industry. And that industry is what's creating the work that's facing you all. IBM, I'm sure, still registers hundreds of programs. Under the old copyright law, from 1964 to 1978, we registered about 2,000 computer programs. Something on the order of 1,600 of those came from two remitters from IBM and Burroughs, who registered virtually every piece of software that they made. The other 400 registrants came from other computer companies, small companies of, of all sorts, but you know this better than I do. But today I think that you're seeing registrations not just from IBM and Burroughs and the manufacturers, you're seeing them from individuals, from small software houses, from hundreds of different, of different competitors that are trying to reach this market for things like Atari game cassettes, for the Apple home computer, for the TRS-80 home computer, and for the dozens of under, other small home and business computers that are out there in the market. Now, that market needs a very different kind of legal protection than the market that went before. And that's why you're seeing people come into the office looking for registration for their computer programs. Economically now, their economic characteristics are much more like a phonograph record. They're much more like a tape cassette. They're not very carefully controlled and easily controllable properties that are transferred by lease. They're sold in hundreds of thousands of copies. And they're susceptible to just the same kind of rip-off piracy that phonograph records and tapes and discs are. And we're beginning to see how that is going to go. I think I'd like to take a break for a couple of minutes if we can. If you have any questions right now, I'll answer them. If not, I'd like to take a break for about uh, five, ten minutes. Yes. Fine? Okay. I guess since a large number of us turn into pumpkins at three o'clock, we should uh, get going. I do have a few other things now that I, I want to talk about with you. Some of the comments that I got at the break lead me to make a couple of further comments about the computer and its nature, and then let's move into talking about how we got to where we are in the Copyright Office. What I have described to you so far about programs is an attempt to try to explain to you a little bit about how you use a computer. You or I would use a computer. When you buy a computer or when some, someone acquires a computer, it doesn't just come as a completely empty box, nor does it come loaded with everything, including all sorts of information. It's somewhere in between. If you buy a computer, it will come with a program installed in it that enables you to put things away in its memory. It will come with another program that does this translation from assembler language code to object code. It'll come with other programs to translate from things like COBOL and FORTRAN and those other fancy languages into the language that it understands. You can, you can buy a program with different amounts of this built-in information, this, these built-in instructions or programs. 
where you can buy the empty computer and buy all your computer programs from an independent software supplier. There are lots of them. But there's certain basic programs that are absolutely necessary to enable the computer to work. Those are called variously an operating system or an executive system and various utility programs and things like compilers and assemblers and translators. Executive or operational pro or, or operating executive programs or operating systems are the bookkeepers that enable the computer to keep track of where it has information, of where things are stored. Utility programs are programs that do special purpose functions like enable you to sort large files of information into various sequences or programs that enable you to do other uh, functions associated with the management of the computer hardware to be able to bill customers for using the, pro the, the computer. Pam? That's a function of the operating system. The question is, how do you know when your computer's full? Well, it goes, <laughs> no. Well, it, it sort of does go burp. No, really, it sort of does go burp. This thing that I described to you is the executive program or the operating system. Associated with each computer, there's a little console typewriter and keyboard that uh, where an operator sits who's in charge of this thing. And the operating system sends messages to that operator. One of the messages can be, uh, hey, I'm full. I can't accept any more data. Hey, uh, a disk drive broke down, or I can't access this tape drive. Or it's time for you, operator, to tell another operator to mount a tape on a certain tape unit. Those are the kinds of programs that are very important to the functioning of the machine and they manage. That's the function of something like an operating system or an executive system to manage things like memory allocation and the uh, use of the various things called peripheral devices. That means things like tape drives and printers and disk drives and the other complex pieces of machinery that are associated with the computer system. Now, if I can back up and figure out where I was before that question. That was a good question. If you look at the first example that I handed out to you, you have four pages that were not stapled together, unfortunately. The first two pages represent, the, just as an example, there's nothing special to look at, the first two pages of a COBOL program, simply written in a COBOL language. That was a program that I wrote a long time ago to do some listings of information about computer program patents. Those are the instructions that tell the computer what to do and how to do something, how to take in some information, how to sort it in several different ways, and how to print out some reports for me. If you look at the third page, it's a very, very poor copy. It's headed data equals input. These are some uh, copies of some punch cards that were made up to list some information about computer program patents. The first card of the series lists uh, the name of the patent, and the second card indicates uh, the assignee, and the third card the date, and so on. Various information about computer program patents. You can think of another term that you've heard, that this is a database. Here are the computer cards that, that correspond to that database. It's a very small one. There are a bunch more cards that I have in my office that go with it. It's a stack about this big. But that's a database of program patents. And you have a program 
that's designed to do something with that database. It was designed to read the database and present some reports. Now, there's a listing that I've labeled output, which should be the fourth page of this sheet of four that I handed you, that shows what the computer did with the information it took in from this database. It presented, it did an output. It did report number one, a listing of these things in patent number sequence. It also did a listing by, uh, let's see, by the next space, which is the patent office's classification number, and a listing by the assignee, the owner of the patent. Now, there you have the three things that are associated with the program. You have an example, just a sample, first two pages of the program. The second, third page, that unit had a data equals input is just that. It's the input data. And the last page is a sample of output. You have a program that took this input in the form of the punch cards and printed several different listings to go along with it. Here's the, the stack of the things. That illustrates what the three different things are. And you can see they look different. They're different sorts of things. The program is a series of instructions. The data is just that. It's just information, unprocessed. And the output represents the data rearranged in a way that makes it usable to a human being. And that's all, all computer programs do. This is a very simplistic example. But all programs are comprised of instructions which tell a computer how to take in information, how to juggle it internally, how to process it, how to do something with it, and then how to output it. It may be output onto a printed listing. It may go to another machine to control it. It may result in sounds that communicate with us as human beings. It may result in images on a display screen like those associated with the Space Invaders pinball or uh, arcade game. Or it may be any one of another wide variety of kinds of input <coughs> or output. Now, what does all this mean to, to us in the office? Well, as I indicated, back in 1964, we made a decision to accept computer programs for registration. The registrability of programs had been discussed before that, but no decision had been taken. And when we finally made a decision to accept them for registration, we did so under what we call our rule of doubt, which all of you are familiar with. Doubtful issues involving registrability of a work will be resolved in favor of registration, if at all possible. We had some doubts about the registrability, copyrightability of computer programs. But we decided it was a doubtful enough question that we, we would resolve that doubt in favor of registration and go ahead and register these things. What was the basis for the doubt? Well, the basis for the doubt stemmed fundamentally from two sources. And those can go back to two cases that I'm sure you're all familiar with, Baker versus Selden and Whitesmith versus Apollo. Baker versus Selden is the case that first enunciated clearly and set out the idea expression distinction. Copyright protects forms of expression of an idea, not the idea itself. Now, translated into computer programs, that comes out as is there any expression in a computer program, or is it a mere manifestation of some mathematical or physical process? Is there any expression involved in a program? First question. Second question had to do with what constituted copies. And that gets us back to the Whitesmith versus Apollo case, in which the Supreme Court said that piano rolls were not copies of sheet music because they were not ordinarily intelligible to human beings. Well, in respect to computer programs, the problem was, what constituted a copy under the old law? Was it 
was a magnetic tape version of a computer program, the form in which they are typically marketed, traded, leased, sold, what have you, a copy within the White Smith Doctrine? Doubtful question, but there were different ways of handling each. Our decision under the old law as to the first question, the Baker versus Selden idea expression problem, was that there probably is some expression involved in a computer program, or at least there's reason to think there may be. Computer scientists tell us that if you are given a, what computer people call an algorithm, the basic process which is embodied in the computer program, there are dozens or hundreds or maybe even thousands of different computer programs that can be written to, to implement that process. And there is choice to be exercised by a computer programmer in the selection of those particular instructions that are used to implement the program and the sequence in which you do them. So it's sort of like a compilation. There's at least authorship in a program that's akin to compilation authorship. Authorship in the selection and arrangement, at a minimum, if there's not some additional authorship in a program beyond that. So the office decided that there was probably authorship involved in the program, but the question was not perfectly settled. Determined it would resolve that question in favor of registrability and accept them. The other question had to do with publication and copies. And the answer to that one was derived by saying that we would accept for registration the work as published, meaning the magnetic tape version, so long as it was accompanied by a human readable printout. That decision extended the computer programs and not computer databases. And that was the decision that under the old law led to the registration of some approximately 2,000 programs before the effective date of the new law. The question was never settled as to whether or not a court would accept the copyright on our, our reasoning in respect to computer programs and their copyrightability. There was no litigation under the old law, only a lot of discussion. Now, without going into any great detail about CONTU and what it did, but part of the revision process involved the creation of this study commission called CONTU to look into questions involved in the copyrightability of computer software and the copyright use of other works associated, or the use, pardon me, the use in computers of other copyright works, databases, what have you. Now, CONTU studied for three years these problems, and it made some recommendations. And its recommendations turned out to be a little bit different because while CONTU was carrying out its deliberations, Congress passed the new copyright law. And the new copyright law, CONTU believed, would deal reasonably effectively with some of the problems that had plagued computer uses of copyrighted works under the old law. As part of the compromise that led to the creation of CONTU, Congress had inserted in the copyright law a section 117 which sought to freeze the status of copyright law in respect to computer uses of copyrighted works as to what it had been under the 1909 law until CONTU would render its report. Well, that was all well and good and good in theory, but the problem was is that there was no law. The only thing we had that uh, amounted to any decision regarding copyrightability of computer program was the Copyright Office's decision to accept these things. Issue was never litigated in court. Legal scholars had written dozens and dozens and dozens of articles about the copyrightability of computer software as well as its protection by patent and trade secret and other methods. But nothing was resolved. Contu made the determination that if you got rid of this crazy section 117, 
that sought to impose the old 1909 law on computer software, you would have eliminated most of the problems associated with using copyright to protect software. The new law specifically does away with the White Smith Doctrine in that its definition of copies indicates that something is a copy so long as you can reproduce from it and communicate the work to a human being. Well, computer tapes, computer chips even, disks, other magnetic devices that are used to store computer programs fall within the definition of copy, probably under the new law, if you get rid of the crazy Section 117. Well, Congress did accept Contu's recommendations, and it got rid of the old Section 117 and enacted the recommendation that Contu had put forth, which had two basic purposes. One was to make it absolutely clear that the new copyright law applied to computer programs. And secondly, its purpose was to place some limits on the rights of exclusive on the exclusive rights of copyright owners in computer programs. And it did that in sort of an interesting way. It says that the owner of copyright in a computer program, pardon me, the owner of a copy of a computer program has the right to copy that computer program to the extent necessary to use it. And indeed, if you even need to make some adaptations of that program in order to be able to use it, you may do so. That's the fundamental characteristic of that act. And it says that you apply the new definition of copies to computer programs, and you treat them as you would any other work under the law, except for this special provision that the owner of copyright in the program cannot prevent someone who owns a copy from copying the program to the extent necessary to use it in a computer. Well, there's a reason for that, and there's a reason why Contu recommended that section be structured in that way. And that was that Contu held a long series of hearings to inquire into what rights were wanted by copyright proprietor or by owners of rights in computer programs. And Contu determined that one of the fundamental things that a computer program proprietor wanted to do was to be able to control the use of the program. Contu also decided that the definition of copy under the new law was so broad that it would include loading a computer program into the memory of a computer that would be making a copy. So that in effect, if the proprietor of copyright in a program has the exclusive right to control copying, you in effect have a species of control of over the use of that particular program. Contu had been urged to suggest that there be something like a performance right in computer programs, specifically separately identified. Contu decided that that wasn't necessary that granting to the copyright owner the exclusive right to control copying would provide a limited usage right. In order to encourage the development and use of things like small home computers in this market where I described to you that programs are sold, Contu suggested some limitation on the rights to make it clear that if you buy a copy of a computer program, you can copy it to the extent needed to make use of it. But the copying beyond that, the copying beyond that would constitute an infringement of those rights. That was Contu's intention. Now, how does that translate into what affects you? Well, it says that 